uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to the ERA Journal Club. Each ERA e-seminar takes place on the last Thursday of your month at 1700 Central European time, and that's 1600 here in Oxford time. And each e-seminar picks out a topic from uh, NDT or CKG, either a recent original research or a key review or commentary article. Um, and at least one expert is on our panel. Um, it's moderated by myself, Will Harrington. I'm an Oxford-based nephrologist and epidemiologist. And the discussion will last um, for about one hour. Um, it's fairly informal and we hope uh, as well as being live, it will be lively. Um, and we encourage you to answer questions, uh, sorry, ask questions, maybe even answer some of them in the Q&A Zoom box. We will try and address as many as we can as we go. And it is recorded and made available on various video platforms. So keep an eye on social media afterwards for various links. Today's topic is vascular calcification in dialysis patients. And, and there are some particularly interesting hypotheses raised today from a meta-analysis. Um, we're very pleased to welcome our presenters, Dr. Wunwun and Dr. Saga Niwaka uh, from the Division of Nephrology, the Department of Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. So welcome from the other side of the pond. Um, uh, and we're very grateful to Ian uh, Bressendorf for joining. He's an expert panelist from Denmark. Um, he's conducted trials in dialysis and populations assessing interventions uh, like magnesium and their effects on vascular calcification. Welcome. Um, and uh, Professor um, Paolo uh, Raggi from um, the Department of uh, Cardiology at the University of Alberta also joins. Um, he has a long standing interest in cardiovascular disease, like myself, particularly cardiovascular disease in chronic kidney disease and vascular calcification, as well as diabetes. So I'm, I'm very pleased to um, have you all today here available for us to discuss this paper. So um, please do take advantage of the world experts you have here and do ask questions. Um, but we're going to start off um, with Wunwin's presentation. So Wunwin, um, tell me, why did you start getting interested in uh, vascular calcification? Thank you, Will, for your introduction. Uh, actually, we, uh, we, 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 we did like, uh, keep attention on, on uh, patients with CKD MBD and also the vascular calcification patients. Uh, we have like a scarcity of uh, treatment to treat them. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we, 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 uh, we know this drug because we normally, uh, we often treat, it, uh, treat calcifilaxis patients with, with sodium lysulfate. And we noticed some trials Files have have uh, included th this drug to treat patients. So we want to know if we can, like, discover its value in these kind of patients, so that uh, we can better treat them. So we decided to do a like meta analysis to see if it's uh, like working. That's why we do this. Study. Very, yeah. yeah, I'm very glad you did because I wasn't aware of the trials and aggregating all the information was fantastically valuable. Title of the presentation today is Intravenous Sodium Disulfate Treatment for Vascular Classification of Hemodialysis Patients. It's a systematic review and meta analysis, which was completed when I uh, was pursuing my master's degree and the guidance of Dr. Sakhni Greka. Um, so without further ado, let's dig into what's in this study. Um, uh, as shown in the pictures on the left, uh, we, can, uh, we know that the uh, vascular calcification can occur in all the vessels in our body. It's a predominant form of vascular uh, disease uh, in patients with chronic kidney disease and is an independent predictor of morbidity and mortality in these patients. The mechanism evokes a transformation from vascular smooth muscle cells to osteoblast-like cells. Uh, we have multiple ways to evaluate the uh, uh, vascular calcification. Uh, first, we have a Gaston spores, which use a CT scan to calculate the sum of density of calcium. And uh, also we have calcium volume score, which also takes slice thickness into account. 
uh, and uh, uh, more uh, like more traditional and either way to evaluate vascular calcification includes uh, like uh, x-ray or ECG. Currently, we also have some blood tests like T50 time or vitamin A reduction ratio, which can partly uh, reflect the burden of calcium uh, in our blood. However, we still do not have approved treatment for vascular calcification. Uh, current therapies uh, were like, was uh, uh, either uh, had co conflicting results or uh, or uh, still in uh, was still in clinical trial. Uh, sodium sulfate, which has been on market for many years, is a challenging agent which can mobilize calcium from deposits and also have antioxidant and vasodilatory activity. It has been used in patients with calcium access since 2004, and in 2008, it is firstly used in uh, vascular calcification. So here we want to know that uh, how's the performance of uh, this drug uh, in treating vascular calcification in our CKD patients. So we designed a systematic review and meta-analysis in which the patient is CKD patients with vascular calcification and the intervention is uh, intravenous sodium disulfate. And the comparison could be placebo or usual care and outcomes here uh, include uh, efficacy parameters like calcification spores, arterial stiffness parameters, uh, and uh, also we have safety parameters like symptoms, safety MBD parameters, uh, electrolytes, and uh, bone binary density. Uh, we searched uh, five main databases for studies, including terms uh, related to calcium and sodium disulfate, uh, and we included uh, studies uh, having adult patients uh, with CKD and uh, having vascular calcification as main complication and primary indication for STS treatment, and it should have uh, include both patients treated with and without. IVSTS. And the study design could be clinical trial or cohort studies. Uh, and the study will be excluded if all or none of the patients in the study have received STS or those who, uh, who have not received a, a, a intravenous STS have received it from other ways. Uh, the continuous variables in our study will be converted into main and standard deviation and uh, will be synthesized and analyzed using random, random effect model. And we also measured the um, heterogeneity and publication bias using certain tests. And we did sensitivity analysis in multiple ways. And we uh, did meta regression on the relationship between uh, certain impact sites uh, and the treatment effectors were publication years. Uh, the risk bias assessment was done by using uh, Cochrane tools like ROB2 or Robis1. Uh, next, I will introduce the results of our study in the following three parts. The first is the study inclusion process and the study characteristics. And the second is uh, for efficacy parameter analysis. And the third one is safety uh, analysis. First, let's look at the, like, the study inclusion flow chart. Uh, from more than 5,000 uh, literature, we finally included six studies. And all of them were clinical trials. Five of them were RCTs, and one of them was non-RCT. And uh, we totally have uh, 305 participants with a mean age of uh, 56 years, and uh, uh, more than 50% uh, of them were males. Uh, here's uh, like the characteristics of the included study. Uh, we can see that all the uh, participants uh, in the clinical trials included were patients uh, on maintenance 
hemodialysis. Uh, but they are from different countries and the STS treatment and the study duration were uh, diverse. And uh, we can see like the uh, outcome measurements here. Uh, some of the studies had reported uh, calcification scores and some of them reported arterial stiffness parameters uh, and some of them reported both. Uh, we also uh, we should also notice that the number of the participants here is not uh, are not very big. They are all like small sample trials. Uh, and uh, here we come to the like the efficacy parameter analysis. First, it's a classification scores. We compared the like the post interventional level and, and change level. Uh, of classification scores between the two groups, uh, the two groups of STS group and the non-STS group. Uh, and what we have found is that uh, like there's a lower increase in a Gaston score for coronary and iliac artery in the STS group compared with the uh, non-STS group. Uh, however, for the calcium volume score, we didn't find any difference between the two groups. Uh, for arterial stiffness, we noticed a uh, like lower increase in the PWV in the SS groups. Uh, for 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 the safety parameters, first is the electrolytes. Uh, what we have found is that the post conventional serum anion gap and uh, change uh, in serum anion gap is larger in the SS group during the trial. Uh, for CVD MPD parameters, we didn't find, find any difference between two groups in their calcium or phosphate level, but we found uh, like lower post conventional 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 uh, in the STS group during the trial. But the change in this parameter uh, did not show any difference between the two groups. Um, for the bone minor density, uh, actually, uh, formally, uh, there are some case reports reporting that there is a reduction of bone minor density in some patients treated with uh, STS. Uh, but in our analysis, uh, we actually didn't find any difference between the two groups from the study reported, uh, reporting uh, BMD here. Uh, for adverse symptoms, we can see the most frequently seen symptom in patients treating with uh, ICS is uh, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms like uh, nausea, vomiting, and anorexia. Uh, and uh, the study uh, with the highest prevalence of GI symptom featured after HD session infusion and also faster infusion time. Uh, we tried to incorporate a method M study, uh, which used a uh, Capella index into our study uh, using Hedges G. Um, but actually we didn't find any difference between the two groups after imputing this study. Uh, but removing this study uh, will again turn like a uh, favorable outcome in the STS group. Uh, in matter regression, we didn't find any correlation between the change in a Gaston score, uh, uh, changing classification scores, uh, between the change in classification scores and STS dose duration or publication years. Uh, in risk of bias assessment, we noticed a high risk of bias uh, in three of the trials included and some concerns in one of the trials. For publication bias, we used the Eagers test to detect it, but we didn't find any small study effect here. Uh, and uh, for heterogeneity assessment, uh, we found a year or so high heterogeneity in the following parameters analysis. 
but fortunately we didn't find a uh, 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 like appears uh, heterogeneity in assets uh, the efficacy parameters included in our study. Um, our study is the first study to systematically assess the effects of STS on vascular classification, especially we made comparisons between uh, patients treated with and without uh, STS. Um, but we did have uh, certain limitations like we, uh, 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 the, the trials in our study only included uh, per protocol analysis uh, in their study. So maybe like uh, selection bias might be introduced in the trials. And uh, um, there are some duplicates in the participants in uh, some of the analysis. So in, in this analysis, we should focus more on the subgroup analysis rather than the overall effects. Uh, and we did notice a various source of heterogeneity and high risk bias uh, in the studies included. So when we look at the results of uh, the meta-analysis, we should take them into account and keep, keep them in mind. Uh, so in conclusion, intravenous sodium sulfate can attenuate the progression of vascular calcification and arterial stiffness in dialysis dependent patients but large and well-designed RCTs are warranted in the future. Uh, that's all of my presentation. And uh, I last want to thank all of our co-authors and also the colleagues from uh, Renal Division in Mass General Hospital. And uh, uh, thank you for your attention uh, and welcome discuss. Thank you, and when that was really clear, congratulations on the paper, um, and thank you so much for your clear descriptions. Um, I really like the paper's graphical abstracts. Um, now NDT has graphical abstracts on the front. It's really very clear, and there were some nice key learning points. Um, I mean, I, I wanted to ask a first question before I open the discussion further. We don't have lay summaries in NDT, um, but if you were to explain your results to someone who was lay, maybe um, to your parents or, or a friend who wasn't medically qualified. Could you explain really what this um, calcification score represents? Uh, you've got coronary artery calcification with estimates of reductions in 241 and iliac arteries of 382 um, Agatston scores. What, what does that mean? Um, uh, could you explain in a, in a lay way whether or not this is an impressive treatment effect or if this is chipping away at the calcification? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, I should say the, like the, the calcification scores included in our study uh, is frequently used, uh, it, uh, are frequently used in like studies evaluating vascular calcification, but uh, they are like not very, frequently used in our clinical practice, actually. Uh, uh, in, 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 very, uh, in, in many studies, like the Agasson score, uh, especially in coronary artery, is uh, correlated with uh, cardiovascular events and cardiovascular endpoints. So uh, if we, you have like a higher calcification score, uh, uh, for example, calcium score or calcium volume score uh, is possible that uh, you you have high risk of like cardiovascular deaths or uh, another uh, endpoint. So so it's a very like meaningful and important parameter for us. Yeah. Okay, and maybe I maybe I could ask just to stay on this topic for a little bit longer. Um, these these scores, I mean, a, a reduction of 240 or a reduction of 380. You know, nowadays we're thinking about surrogates of kidney disease progression, and you know, we've got thresholds which are considered to be clinically meaningful, or thresholds which predict a, a clinically meaningful effect. Have you got one of those numbers in your head for these scores? Do you have to reduce it by 200 to be significant and likely to have an effect on clinical outcomes, or is any reduction important? Yeah, actually, uh, I should say in, in, in patients with uh, like CKD, especially in patients uh, on hemodialysis, we, we don't have a, like uh, 
uh, we, we, we don't have uh, like uh, clinical trials or like cohort studies to evaluate the, uh, the effect of a certain drugs like sort of nasofit on their uh, long-term uh, improvement of uh, this patient's outcome. So we, we cannot answer this question now, but, but uh, we, if we can like do further uh, like follow up on these patients, we, we might can uh, answer them in the future. Yeah. yeah. Right. If, if I may. Yeah, Paolo, you mm -hmm. if you don't mind, uh, I'm coming to Wen's help here. Uh, a few years ago, we published an analysis on the effect on calcification of uh, phosphate binders as well as calcium mimetic. This was published in the, in the Lancet. Now, because none of the trials that have been conducted on vascular calcification regression had enough numbers to prove outcome, we had to pile them all together, looking at vascular calcification progression or inhibition and outcome as a compiled outcome from all the, the trials. Actually, the publication was very provocative because it did show, on average, a slowing of 200 points in the Augustine score with a reduction in overall cardiovascular mortality related to that. That's only a meta-analytic information. It's not a proper randomized clinical trial, but it gives you an indirect answer to your question. So what you have shown when, when may be really relevant, you know, even the non-progression would be very impactful, but you have shown a potential regression or attenuation of progression uh, in treated patients compared to untreated patients. So I think that actually is a, a, relevant, um, a relevant outcome. The question I have for you though is, can you highlight for me in your mind, what are the obvious limitations, the gross limitations, the most obvious limitations of the trials that you reviewed? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Reggie, for, for like your supplements on the questions and uh, your your uh, question. Um, actually, uh, what didn't show in my limitations uh, like presented here is that uh, uh, one is uh, that I, I have mentioned is that the like the study uh, the studies included uh, all small size studies. And also the number of trials included, uh, like uh, actually the present uh, evidence we, we can get uh, are very small. Uh, and also for what uh, the outcomes we, we, we interested uh, in our study, uh, not all of the studies provide their evidence on our outcomes. So uh, for each outcome, we, we have a scarcity of uh, data here. So after synthesize them, uh, maybe some of the like uh, an analysis only included one or two study. So the, the uh, although it's a meta-analysis, but uh, uh, the like the the evidence it can be it provide a stronger uh, confidence uh, is not very like uh, big for us to. To, 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 to get. So that, that's a like uh, uh, very obvious uh, limitation in, in, in our study. Yeah, so this isn't practice changing research at the moment. This is generating an interesting hypothesis and it sounds like the size of the effects raised by the hypothesis are sufficient to warrant wanting to investigate this potentially further. Um, do you- Well, if I could comment yeah, on that perhaps. Yeah. Please do, yeah. Sorry, it's a, yes, to, um, to sort of reiterate Paolo's point, but also um, it's, it's very rare. In fact, I don't remember ever having seen it in a, in a decent sized trial that you see actual regression of calcification. Uh, what we usually see is that there's ongoing calcification and then you can perhaps delay the calcification, and, uh, but to have actual regression of it, uh, I don't believe I've ever seen that before. Um, and and I wonder what that, what that means is if it is actual regression, if, if you imagine that you have a, a calcified vessel and, a, um, and a, a smooth muscle cell, which has undergone differentiation into a, a bone forming um, cell, and then this bone then decalcifies, what does that 
cell behave like afterwards? Is it still a vascular cell or is it now a, a bone cell in your vessels, but which is no longer calcified? Um, I don't know what, if it, if the if what we are seeing here is is true. I don't know what it would mean for um, uh, for cardiovascular risk, but I think it's very interesting to see, as I said, actual regression. Yeah, actually, like uh, the drugs like sodium disulfate and uh, also a uh, new drug uh, SNF four seventy two. Uh, they are like hypothesis to like challenging the calcium uh, when, when they are in like solid uh, particles. So uh, in, in their mechanism, they, they may could like uh, change the situation in this way. Uh, and in, in our analysis, uh, we can see like the, the increase of the like the, the the, 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 the gaston score actually is like negative. Uh, here, the main difference is negative here in the treatment group. So in some patients we did observe, uh, or, or in some group of patients, we did observe the, like the re regression of the uh, like classification scores. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? Second half. No, this is a, a fascinating question, Ian, uh, in terms of the uh, both biological and the clinical relevance of regression. Um, may not be exactly applicable to the vascular calcifications that Dr. Wen and I studied in this paper. Uh, but if we look at um, you know the potential mechanisms of sodium thiosulfate in the context of microvascular calcifications of calciphylaxis, for example. Uh, Sharon Mose group from the Indiana University uh, has done some very nice in vitro work in that area, where Sharon has shown that, uh, first of all, adipocytes or the vascular smooth muscle cells, when they're exposed to uh, calcifying environment like high phosphate media, for example, uh, they change phenotype. And I think Ian, you alluded to it that the vascular smooth muscle cell mod will start expressing the, uh, the osteogenic genes, for example. And actually same thing will happen with an adipocyte, at least in the Petri dish. It will start, it will reduce the expression of the adipogenic uh, genes and would rather actually start expressing some of the osteogenic genes. But more interestingly, when we, when in that experiment, Dr. Mo's group put adipocytes next to vascular smooth muscle cells, the adipocytes could unidirectionally calcify the vascular smooth muscle cells, but the vascular smooth muscle cells could not do the same with the adipocytes. And in the same experiment, when sodium thiosulfate was introduced, the calcification of vascular smooth muscle cells that were adjacent to the calcified adipocytes did get attenuated. You know, raising a hypothesis that maybe sodium thiosulfate, at least in the context of conditions like calciphylaxis, may work by actually reducing or potentially impacting this uh, effect of some kind of an adipokine on the vascular smooth muscle cell calcification. So, from that perspective, I am hopeful if these results are truly, um, you know, confirmed. If these are confirmed in subsequent uh, uh, trials and more biological studies that maybe the, we have a potential that the cell phenotype that has changed into a bone phenotype may reverse uh, to being again a compliant vascular smooth muscle cell. But of course, you can sense the hesitation in my comment there just because we don't have the data, but that will be one of the speculations that I hope will be confirmed in future studies. Paolo, did you have something to add? No, just uh, in reality, he's already answered his own, uh, my own uh, remark here, and Ian is corrected in all of the randomized trials that we have done, both myself, Ian, and others. Regression has been almost impossible to demonstrate. And the question, you back the question, then can you reverse the process of ossification? Can you reverse the a transformation, phenotypic transformation of an adipocyte into an osteoblast. Can an osteoblast turn into a fibrocytic cell? I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, so that's a really interesting question there. When I mentioned that um, uh, thiosulfate may work as a chelating agent, um, 
that is interesting. And do you think that it may go in and remove a little bit of calcium at the time from the deposits? And this chelation uh, hypothesis has been around for hundreds of years. I don't know really what it means, to be very honest, and how it works at the level of the vessel wall. Anyway, just fascinating hypothesis and chatting here. But I don't think that we have any scientific evidence or any, any of these processes. Very nice to see a lot of this data replicated. There are some practical questions in the, in the chat. Uh, there was a question about the duration of treatment um, uh, with STS. I saw the trials were between three and about 12 months. Uh, but uh, were the patients treated for those full durations, do you know, when, when, or is it shorter in interventions? Uh, you mean like in clinical practice? Yeah, or, so in, in the trials, how, how long were they treated for? Were they treated for the few, full duration of the trial, for four months, for, for 12 months, or are these much shorter treatments? Uh, yeah, they, they, they should be like treated for the full duration of the trials and didn't like stop. Yeah. If they like uh, drop out because of some reasons, they may stop treating them. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh -huh. And so this, so I, the, I was struck by the safety data. Um, the questions about fracture uh, seem reasonable to raise given the mechanisms of the drug. Uh, uh, um, do you think it's long enough to be reassured that these treatments are safe in terms of renal bone disease? Uh huh. Uh, actually, uh, what what we have uh like invested, uh, investigated here is like uh the safety and parameters and also bone mineral density. Uh uh, although we have certain limitations on, on the like the the the, the uh, analysis here, but we did like, but for the calcium and phosphate, we did uh, like synthesized uh, uh, a number of studies results here, uh, what we found is that the calcium and the phosphate didn't change much by using SDS. But in, in like the former uh, case reports that there are some uh, studies showing uh, uh, like the increase of calcium or, or phosphate level in patients treating with SDS. But in our maintenance, we didn't notice that. So this may, may like uh, provide better like evidence for us uh, in clinical practice, and for for vitamin D three, uh, in in our discussion we uh, we also discussed about it. Uh, what we think is that we uh, it's, it it didn't seem uh, very much possible that the, this drug will change the vitamin D three level directly. Uh, it might might be uh, changing like uh, might, um, might might be changing. Uh, vitamin D3 or IPTH level by uh, like uh, altering calcium or phosphate level. Uh, so actually in our study, we didn't notice any like difference uh, in, in their change in vitamin D3. So uh, we, we don't think it will like, uh, uh, like interact with the CKD MPD parameters, uh, at least in our study. And uh, for the bone mineral density, uh, I should uh, I, I should confess that the uh, the, the study uh, in this analysis uh, is only one. We, we, we had only one study uh, reported their BMD level uh, before the treatment and after the trial complete, uh, uh, completed. And, uh, um, uh, and they, they reported the BMD level in two locations. So we, uh, but they, they didn't compare them between the two groups. So what, what, what we did is that we like uh, converted them and compared them between the two groups. Uh, but in these two locations, we can see that they didn't show any difference in, in their change level or post-invention level. Uh, but we still need more data, more studies to uh, like demonstrate this uh, uh, like conclusion in the future, I should say. Whilst we're on the topic of safety, I don't know if anyone wanted to comment on the mechanism for the nausea and intravenous infusion. It seems that the nausea is very frequent. Um, what, is there an obvious mechanism and, and what do people do clinically to try and prevent it? Um, Sagar. Sure, that's an excellent question. And you're absolutely right. I think um, in terms of the 
uh, what we know from the off-label use of sodium thiosulfate for the conditions like calcifylaxis, uh, nausea is the most common symptom in our registry experience and also other published studies confirm that the frequency could be anywhere between 15 to 25%. What I have observed clinically is uh, nausea is quite a bit uh, dose dependent and also dependent on the timing of the administration, particularly for a dialysis patient. So if the medication is administered post hemodialysis, uh, the, the, the probability of nausea is higher as opposed to when it is administered in the last 30, 40 minutes of dialysis. The mechanism for nausea is, is at least to me not very clear and has not been well studied uh, as far as I know. Uh, one possibility though, the nausea may be centrally mediated considering sodium thiosulfate is a hypertonic solution. Uh, each you know, 25 gram dose, for example, that we typically use for conditions like calcifylaxis has approximately six gram of uh, sodium load and the solution is quite uh, hypertonic. So we actually, in our clinical practice, uh, sometimes have been able to address and mitigate the nausea uh, just by mixing the sodium thiosulfate in a hypotonic solution like the D5 water. Uh, and it does help in many instances, but obviously we don't have a full understanding for the mechanism of um, uh, the nausea, but it is dose dependent and it does depend on the timing of the administration. And if it's central nausea, then is it easy to treat with anything with prophylaxis? Do, did the trials use antiemetics? Oh, presumably they did to maintain people on treatment. Yeah, very good point. And yes, uh, uh, in fact, that does work uh, uh, also, especially for patients who are at high risk for nausea or already have baseline nausea from other conditions. When we again use this as an off-label agent for calcifylaxis, we do uh, uh, get these patients on medications like ondansetron, for example. However, uh, one of the concerns, and although uh, the trials that Dr. Ben presented did not um, systematically assess this in great detail, um, the QTC prolongation has been described as one of the possible complications of the sodium thiosulfate infusions. And, uh, you know, of course, dialysis patients, um, uh, as it is, may have a baseline QTC that is prolonged. Uh, and more importantly, when they're getting other medications like ondansetron, for example, that may further prolong their QTC. So something that, you know, at least in clinical practice with the off-label use of thiosulfate, uh, something that we monitor closely and are quite sensitive to before adding something like ondansetron for anti-emetic action. Okay, it's really interesting. And uh, um, I, I, I've got more questions. So did anyone else want to raise any? I don't want to hog one one and saga. No, look, well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask another one. Um, so um, uh, there is a question in the chat here um, uh, about other markers of um, vascular calcification. Uh, uh, osteoprotogerin is one that's mentioned here, um, which I haven't, I'm not familiar with using myself. It's been asked by Juan Carlos Ramirez Sandoval from Mexico City, who's interested in CKD MBD in particular. I was just wondering if any of these trials here um, had measured anything else that you didn't specify and extract that was interesting that's consistent with the, the effects you're seeing. Um, and I'm also wondering what you measure in your trials at the moment, um, whether or not you measure anything else other than calcification scores. So I guess that's a question for you, Wim, Wim, and then maybe the, the, the second question for Paolo and Ian. Whether, was there anything else mentioned in these trials which you didn't report on? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, they didn't report. Uh, they didn't report any like other blood test parameters, like uh, the predictors. Uh, what we didn't uh, report here is uh, I, I I remember one of the studies uh, also reported like the uh, some parameters in ECG but only one of the studies had them. So we didn't uh, include it in our study uh, due to the like the content limit. Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, what we didn't include it here, but uh, we, we, we can look into it uh, in the future if we uh, uh, ha have like interest on some cohort studies or uh, clinical trials uh, regarding the like 
vascular calcification. Yeah, great. And Ian, what do you measure then? Do you, or how would you have measured? Uh, well, I was just uh, to say, perhaps all, um, partly relating to the question uh, with um, both the uh, osteoprotagoran, but also in general, some of the markers of, of uh, mineral bone disease, um, that as I understand it, if SGS is a, a chelating agent, I wouldn't actually expect any changes to uh, any of these markers. I think the, the mechanism is perhaps um, more uh, physiochemical, if you like, um, rather than perhaps getting into the uh, more hormonal uh, feedbacks and um, um, that system. I, I wouldn't expect any uh, osteoprotegan, which a, um, a, a rank ligand um, as a decoy receptor for that. I, I wouldn't expect any difference in that, although, I mean, this is purely speculative. There's no data on it, but but I, I think it doesn't surprise me that we don't see any differences in phosphate and calcium and PTH. I think the mechanism is a different one, uh, which uh, should be independent of that. Yes, I have nothing to add to that, except that if you have the same problems that we have in Canada, we often run out of money for trials <laughs> and we try to cut off what is not considered strictly necessary. Uh, Osteoprotegrin is a definitely interesting marker, but uh, unfortunately it falls by the wayside when we have to cut off um, expenses. So it would be nice to measure everything, osteopontin, osteoconnecting, osteo, osteo everything. But I think that uh, there's a limit to the degree of curiosity we can satisfy. Um, uh, so the, um, th there is a question um, from the chat about and PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, obviously, people think about lipid lowering sometimes in atherosclerotic disease. Um, uh, it sounds like this is very much vascular media calcification, but if you were to reduce atheroma, maybe you might reduce intimal calcification. Is, is there any data that these newer drugs might be something we should be considering studying in dialysis patients? I'm just trying to think of how we would get funding to do a vascular calcification trial in dialysis patients, and we could fund it some way and factor in T STS as a, an additional analysis or additional intervention. I think that there are, <clears throat> there are a few pieces of evidence over there already in the literature that lipid lowering agents actually increase vascular calcification, at least in the general population. Uh, some small piece of evidence, even in a CKD population, mostly because they act most likely through the increase in uh, atherosclerotic uh, calcification regression or repair, put it as you like. But when uh, statins were tried in patients with calcification in the general population, actually calcification increased, not decreased. So uh, it's the opposite of what you would expect. However, that calcification increase was not linked at the same time with an increase in cardiovascular events. So that tells you that the increase in calcification in the general population has to do with healing of the plaque rather than worsening. I do not have similar data on the renal population, although there are some observational studies that have shown similar trends in the, general, in the CKD population. Um, so um, it, you mentioned some of the other studies that have been performed, um, trying to put this in context. Um, I know there is a platform trial starting with calciphylaxis, you know, beat calci, um, includes different cutoff dialyzers, also includes uh, uh, as part of the platform, um, STS, I think it includes um, uh, vitamin K and, and magnesium citrate. It sounds like that that's a, you know, studying a rare disease and a very important disease, and it's focusing on micro, you know, vascular calcification, but there's a real case to set up a platform trial within the vascular calcification um, dialysis population more broadly and to do a similar clever set of interventions, a series of interventions where you would quickly try and identify based on a surrogate marker, ones which are likely to progress to clinical outputs and then continue the investigation to hard outcomes. Is the research field in vascular calcification building to that or is it already ongoing and I haven't spotted, spotted it? Um, 
I guess that's a question I mean, for Ian. You've been busy looking at magnesium. Do you know of anyone going sort of multinational platform trials and vascular calcification interventions? Not that I'm aware of. Um, in general, the uh, trials on vascular calcification are uh, plagued by lack of funding. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, every now and then a, 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 a new company will, will put a, a drug out that, that might be helpful. Um, but I, I'm not aware of platform trials, although it's a good idea. Um, and I would think if you were to, to pick a surrogate mark, I would think uh, that uh, the calcium score would be a, is, a, is a decent bet. Um, um, and I think what's unfortunately some of the um, previous trials where we've uh, had an intervention where we've actually been able to uh, to show uh, as I say not a, not a regression but at least a delay in progression of calcification haven't um, uh, really ended up um, um, uh, showing reductions in in, in clinical events um, but I'm not aware of platforms good idea though and, um, and uh, what's, what's the next big vascular calcification trial we're waiting to report? Is there going to be any news at the ASN of, of new new trials, um, or um, are we sort of waiting for you know the next big trial to be thought up? <coughs> well, as you might be aware of, we completed the SNF four seventy two trials um, almost two year, two and a half years ago. The company that sponsored the trial was, uh, as Ian said, a tiny company that comes popped out of nowhere and came up with this great idea, showed that the compound works and then uh, was absorbed by one of the giants of pharmaceutical agents. And nobody really knows what's happening to this SNF472, which was so promising. So I was expecting something in that field, but um, I'm not aware of anything being, at the moment at least, being planned as a phase three trial. And so um, maybe we could just briefly move. There's a lot of questions about calciphylaxis in the chat. I think people are very, so very much link STS with calciphylaxis. Do, do, do you all use it in your practice if someone's diagnosed with calciphylaxis lesions? Are we all pretty confident that it's effective and there isn't really space for a, a trial? Or uh, do you think that beat calcium is going to randomize very happily because there is still uncertainty about its benefits? Ian. Uh, I say uh, it hasn't been tested in a randomized clinical trial, so I mean I'm optimistic, but it's definitely not. Uh, I mean we don't know that it works, um, and we uh, calciphylaxis is such a terrible disease that we throw the kitchen sink at it and do everything we can, um, but but we don't have any good evidence that it actually works. So it's definitely ripe for a for an ICT. I would, uh, in my opinion. There's even a question here about whether or not you can use STS by other treatment you know, directions. They even suggest can you use it locally on a large calciphylaxis lesion? Is, is that possible? I mean, it seems if you're trying to get it to the microvasculature that putting it topically might might be effective. But has that ever been considered or is that a saga? Yes, yeah, so um, I mean, of course, uh, uh, sodium thiosulfate and its potential application to calciphylaxis has been of great interest to our research group. Um, we did uh, uh, start a randomized trial, a phase three trial, a um, uh, few years before the pandemic, uh, but uh, in the US, um, the study was also actually approved by Health Canada. So it was a multi nation study. Unfortunately, um, uh, recruitment uh, was not easy. Uh, partly because it was designed as a placebo control study. And even though we had two is to one randomization, there was a huge reluctance on the part of the clinicians and the participants to get potentially randomized to the placebo group, even for a three week study. Uh, and then of course, pandemic happened. The study unfortunately was terminated early. I'm really encouraged to see the beat Calci design where it's a smart design. And you know, if you get randomized to thiosulfate and if you're improving, you, you have a higher probability of staying in that arm. Uh, if you are not, then you, know, you will get assigned to magnesium or vitamin K arm. Uh, but yes, thiosulfate, even though yes, we use it clinically off-label quite a bit, uh, I think the efficacy, as Ian rightly pointed out, is unclear. Um, the topical uh, uh, treatments also have been described and our 
uh, center has published a protocol based on some of the observational experience. Um, uh, in what I have observed is in patients who have limited lesions, early lesions, uh, and particularly in those patients who are not on dialysis, uh, the topical sodium thiosulfate injections can be helpful. Uh, but again, no randomized trial data uh, for that uh, strategy and incredibly difficult to study this calciphylaxis population considering its rarity and the uh, complexity of these patients. The SNF472 that was mentioned um, uh, is actually also in a phase three clinical trial for the indication of calciphylaxis. And here we'll see what the results for that show. It was promising to see its effect on the coronary calcification in the phase two trial that was published at couple of years ago, uh, and now we're waiting the results for the calciphylaxis for the same drug. Great. Well, um, I think that's a great point to stop because it sounds like there is work um, ongoing, there are results to see. I do hope the calciphylaxis trials also measure some other measures of calcification in, in large vessels, um, an opportunity still is dialysis patients and uh, They'll have calcification. Um, I've really enjoyed this. So thank you to um, Wunwun uh, and, and Saga for presenting their paper and uh, Paolo and Ian for being such fantastic um, expert panelists and sharing their knowledge. Um, thank you on behalf of the ERA Journal Club. Um, I've been buoyed by this new focus on vascular calcification. I've spent so much time thinking about lipids and heart failure. So um, uh, I'm going to go back to the NDT website. I've already seen a, patient, a paper which looks particularly interesting, looking at um, CYP2, F4A1 and KR polymorphisms and their, their associations with vascular calcification. And that was published in November last year by uh, nephrona investigators. Um, so um, I also encourage listeners to, to read the meta-analysis paper. You should see um, uh, the details on the screen understand these are becoming available so they are free for you to to read um, as always to help us keep these seminars running please do stay online for just a short period afterwards and answer the survey we really appreciate your feedback and please do keep putting the last thursday of the month in your diary to join the era journal clubs next month jennifer lees and kate stevens are back and they're planning to discuss how different degrees of obesity um, or in, uh, impact on the benefits of transplantation, or indeed maybe don't impact. I don't want to spoil the story, um, but I'll certainly be logging in and listening. But for now, it's goodbye from myself, Will Harrington, and from the panel. Thank you for listening. Thank you. It was a Thank, pleasure. You. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.